Uh, so essentially starting out with a 1v1 on, on as neutral of grounds as we can have here. There's, you know, a bunch of different maps, but we're starting out with, you know, a completely different game as opposed to, you know, even like the turf war or the ranked modes that we might normally see. Uh, and the teams, you know, they, uh, this is sort of their chance to designate a captain, as it were, to sort of pick who they want to represent them in the form of this table turf game and then have that set the stage with our later modes and there will be elements of sort of counter picking involved alongside the audience interaction and voting that we're going to see so this is a nice way to start out where we get to play some table turf have you know a winner decided almost in a turbo chess style format here as you mentioned just the 10 seconds per turn um and of course if it happens to be a tie uh there are a few tiebreakers that we have in place just in case we do go the distance in that way yeah, and I think now we're finally getting settled into our first match of games here. There are the maps on the screen, folks. Um, if you would like to vote and take part in helping us out to get these creators started with the Clash, now is your chance to tell us what map you would like to see these folks play. And remember, with a 10 second term limit, so uh, kind of like some chess, right? You gotta make that decision really quick and then slap the timer uh, to let your opponent know that it's their turn next. Um, and this is no different, very, very similar, but honestly a lot more fun, a lot more, a lot more pizzazz if you will, than chess. Yeah, and the, in the same way, you know, the, the chess board will never change in and of itself. It always, you know, it's a game as old as time, but in here, y'all get to sort of select the field in which they're playing. So we have some great options here, sort of some squares colliding, an almost plus sign. You have something that's trying to be an S, but kind of looks like the Loch Ness Monster instead. And then just a nice little rectangle with some, some lines in the middle separating temporarily uh, friend from foe here. So looks like the timer has expired on this one and the vote is going to go wow. to river drift as our starting map it's giving a cat dog it's giving <laughs> um a snake with two heads it's giving uh dare i say it tetris piece it's giving like you said uh, it's trying to be an s but it's not quite there um maybe a backward z <laughs> well, however you want to look at it, River Drift is going to be the, the choice, which I think it's silly that we had a tie uh, for double Gemini and over the line, um, but just not quite making it over to uh, the the peak as River Drift did. So, um, you know, this, this one is actually really unique to me because I don't feel like there's a lot of um, bigger card pieces that can fit on this map. Yeah, they say beauty lies in symmetry, and this one is going to be uh, sort of a symmetrical map that we're going to be going to. And as you mentioned, you know, with sort of a thinner map, you're going to have a really tough time placing those higher value, the 15, 14, 13 value pieces. And you're going to have to rely on making smaller or mid-sized moves that aim to block off your opponent from sort of entering into any part of your map while trying to carve a niche for yourself to get into your opponent's side of the map. And of course, we'll have to see how those specials are used throughout the game as well, how many of those blocks they can build up. And it looks like it'll be Anki versus Dude as the potential starting pair here for this Turbo Turf. Like that we're re it's revealed to us like right when the game is about to start that it's those two people that are playing. So um, Enki and Dude are going to be facing down in the, sh the beginning of this showdown. Um, I believe that Dude has actually played a little quite a bit of table turf. Call me uh, if I'm mistaken. Um, so I think Dude actually ha might have the upper hand in this opening bout. It's quite scary, and and honestly, I when if I see somebody who is using a badge from Table Turf, one of the upper sort of echelon, the badge that lets me know that they've really been grinding it out in Table Turf, I know that they are down for just about anything. It doesn't matter how monotonous it is. It doesn't matter, you know, just sitting there and using their brain without all the movement that goes into the normal Splatoon modes. It really does make me. Think of that person as being at least more disciplined and patient, if nothing else. And I'm, I'm wondering if we'll see any of that on the badges or player cards as they go in here. And we have River Drift loaded up. Anki versus Dude. Ten seconds per turn. And the hands are now being dealt. 
Yeah, I always like that you have the option to redraw your hand. I think that adds like a, a nice little spice and flavor to it. But the opening push is going to be done with the tri stringer, um, and then and the dynamo roller to try to combat it. So that's about an equal amount of squares going in on the first round. But I like that we're seeing this perspective from Enki. Enki is starting off really strong here, Zach. I mean, they are just trying to stretch all the way across as far as they can. But I think this clap back from Dude pulling out the steel eel, they are immediately blocked before causing any more damage. Yeah, just about as we predicted here, sort of the 10, 11, 12 range for the cards here, and they start to brush up against each other immediately in turn two, and they do, in fact, it looks like just barely locking them out. You can see that gray piece there where they both laid down some traction, and now, oh, just not having enough in this 10 seconds to try and place down this reef slider. Are they going to be able to find it? They just barely get a place there in the bottom right-hand corner. That's counteracted by the Splatana Wiper Deco but it's gonna be an extra five points here for Enki as they take the lead. Yeah, I, I think it's great that Enki had a little bit of those yellow squares cut off by that blue because they just have a tiny bit to try to extend themselves more into Dude's territory. And they are getting some bigger and bigger cards, even though they're not quite able to use them just yet. But if they can just get themselves past the Dynamo, that's a lot of space that they can work with. However, if Dude, I think Dude has to be mindful if they want to try to block Enki before going further because Dude is also blocked off from trying to get any further with, into Enki's space. And they do just that. They go in and they block any more momentum that Enki will have to cause more damage with those big cards. And so Enki is kind of running out of straws here. Yeah, Enki, just as you said, they're kind of on both ends of the spectrum in terms of huge value cards and super low value cards. They finally now get a card worth nine, but I'm not sure where they have room to place it. They're just going to opt to go for the one instead and get those two guaranteed ult points there. It's now four ult points apiece for Dude and Enki, and with four turns left, we may start to see those come out sooner rather than later to build up some space. Oh yeah, and look at this. Enki was trying to think, maybe I can extend just a little bit more. There's a lot of dude's color going in there, but they are going to try to special each other out. And it looks like dude is going to be able to claim a little bit of space that Enki had taken previously, but Enki is doing exactly the same to dude. So it's really just a matter of where can I place the cards correctly and whose squares can I take while also gaining more advantage and not allowing anybody else to take my squares. And I think right there with dude having the attack first and Enki able to lay over that is going to give um enki another upper hand there however i think dude has got a really really solid lead here and i think they were just able to extend themselves on this board very tactfully yeah you tried to warn us in the beginning it's going to be this blue schematic versus the dapple dualies here a couple of extra points taken overall by enki but it may be too little too late as in the final turn dude crosses the triple digit threshold both of them going to be passing, and that will do it. Dude, coming away with the victory over Enki and Table Turf, 100 to 76. That was domination here. We saw blows being traded back and forth. We saw in the middle of that Enki having trouble with their hand being stuck with some pieces that they just could not get rid of, having to use those threes, twos, and ones. And that is going to be, it looks like, Kenzie's Kingpins taking a point here to start us out. And just to reiterate, folks, the, the the guys and gals and everyone else that are on these two teams are creators. So a majority of these folks are also streaming. So if you are interested in another POV, thought may, maybe, you know what, you want to check out the Barry stream. You want to go see what Pyro Knight's doing, Will Gravy. You want to go see maybe what Enki's doing. Remember that some of these folks are streaming. So we do like that you're here on the off the dial stream with Zach and I. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. We like that you're here. We like that you're here and hanging out with us. However, just remember that these folks are creators, so do your best to support them if you don't already. Um, but these opening games, you have 360, or excuse me, no, that's behind it. You have Sheldon's Request, Noobs, and Polite Writers. Now, I really enjoy Noobs because I just, I like going back to the beginning. Let's go back, back to the beginning. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's the fun stuff to me. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's folks who have been talking about, oh, Splatoon 3 starting to near the end of its life cycle. You know, after a while, we're not going to be getting any updates anymore. Why not take yourself back to where the first day you either downloaded the game for the first time or unboxed it, the physical version yourself, and you had to start out with that Splattershot Jr. You had to start out 
with that beginning gear. Uh, and you started, of course, before you unlock the rank modes with Turf War. So this is going to be, if, if that one is chosen, so interesting to see. You know, we also have Sheldon's Requests up there, uh, which is going to include a ranked mode, but will encompass, you know, a certain specific weapon that each, at least one member of each team is going to have to bring. So as far as audience participation there, a little bit of mandating in that front to sort of help teams have to play one style or one weapon over another and then polite writers to round us out another ranked mode based one this time on tower control uh and if you're gonna hit a checkpoint in that mode you are obliged and in fact mandated to jump back to your spawn if you are not there already or you were already splatted so that one's great it gives you know a mode that has some pauses built in even more pause if you sort of make that progress as far as clearing through a checkpoint. So three fantastic options. I'm looking forward to seeing how as we start to up that chaos level, uh, these two teams shape out as we finally see them on the actual Splatoon battlefield. Yeah, and remember, since Kenzie's Kingpins won that first table turf game, I believe the counter pick is over uh, to Takara's Tacticians. Um, and so Takara's tacticians are going with polite writers. So as you said, Zach, all players must jump back to the spawn when their team clears a checkpoint. Um, these are the four maps that you get to pick from. The name of the game is Tower Control. Um, and so we need your participation and your help to figure out where we are going to go and play this game. Um, and personally, hmm. if you, Zach, if you had to vacation, at any one of these places and d don't pick the resort just because i said vacation okay like come on be be original here where would you go where would you want to explore okay well you know i do like cities but flounder heights really does feel like just where you would live it just looks like you know apartment complexes kind of your day-to-day -day. ship shape cargo co it looks a little dreary a little depressing almost oil rig-esque i'm not sure i i would survive and I'm, I'm a little intimidated, to be honest, of, of picking resorts. So I'll stray away from that one, which leaves me with Umami Ruins. So if I had to go visit, you know, I have, I've never been to Egypt or any, you know, sort of ruinous sites or anything like that. So I feel like it would be a great new experience. The weather looks nice. Got, ni got some nice blue skies there. So if we're going off of that aim purely, vacation-based, we'll take Umami Ruins. But nobody shares my opinion, at least for vacationing. It looks like for uh, this round, we have six out of eight votes going to to Mahi Mahi Resort, which is where polite riders will take place this time around. Sheep. All of you sheep <laughs> going to Mahi Mahi Resort. That's fine. We'll go on vacation there. It looks like a fun old time down in the water park. I would hang out at this water park, although I don't think it would be very great for any children under the age of 12, uh, just considering the different gaps and leaps and bounds you would have to do just to get from platform to platform. Unless you had it where the stage is as it is at the second half of games where you have a floor uh, appear seemingly out of nowhere <laughs> from the depths and everything gets <laughs> filled out. So, I mean, I guess it just depends on your comfort level. Um, with Mahi, though, these different tower checkpoints um, are very, very open, not very well uh, defended, I guess. It's kind of hard to be a tower rider out at Mahi, so I think this is a really interesting choice, considering um, once you clear that checkpoint, you do have to leave. However, um, trying to fight and stay on the checkpoint is a whole different story. Yeah, it's a perilous battlefield. I mean, you're, you're in sort of tight cubbies and situations a lot of the time you know you're constantly trying or at least if you're me trying not to fall into the water which is a very tricky feat if uh depending on what weapon especially you're playing but this one speaking of weapons there's no sort of restrictions to my knowledge on what weapons you can bring or anything and uh so teams can feel pretty confident in weapons that they either enjoy or that they particularly like to bring in tower control and as speaking of creators you know one of our creators chara did a poll recently uh just several days ago it looks like on the 18th for all of the ranked modes and for the four options that we had i think the only one that actually got any votes was ship shape cargo co so i was thinking maybe that one would get picked as a result but we are instead going to go to mahi mahi resort maybe all that uh vacation talk led us in the way of a resort over all the other options yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, you want to go and have a seat by the pool and dip your feet in, I guess this is where you want to be. But nevertheless, that's not what the creators are going to be doing here. But they are going to pick some really fun things. Wowie zowie, look at this board, Zach. 
I mean, yeah, uh, a Clash Blaster Neo is not something that I had on my bingo board. You can see all mains of Ink Saver main for that weapon in particular. We've also got things like a 96 Gal Deco already one down as it looks like the Range Blaster will fall here and already turf starting to be carved out as we get started in this game. Yeah, and already you can see that Ken Kenzie's Kingpins are going to make that first, or excuse me, no, that's Takara's Technicians. Or tacticians. These guys, they pick they pick these names sometimes and they expect <laughs> us to say them right. Takara's tacticians are gonna be the first ones to get points on the board. We're about 30 seconds in with two members down on Kenzie's Kingpins currently. You can see Nine doing a great job holding on to this tower, trying to find some footwork here and getting forward. There's a lot of orange on the board, so this is a really good position uh, for the tacticians to be in. You can see Vasco's gonna opt to go ahead and jump out and go back to where Nine is at in the spawning area there. But a lot of fights are trying to be taken by Chara too. Chara team seems to find themselves in a two versus one situation, but I think that's because Barry especially knows that they don't want them getting too close to that tower because it can be very dangerous for them to get comfortable. Yeah, so we just saw both first checkpoints get crossed, right? And in both situations, either half or the majority of the team were not really on the tower or were uh, deceased at that point. Only one or two people jumped back to spawn after making it to that checkpoint. So basically, each team only did that. So now we're finally seeing uh, some progress being made here as Chara pushing forward with the range blaster, trying to make some room. It's going to be Enki, the designated tower rider, as Chara has to back off. Now the crab tank has Chara tries to take it down, and they will be forced to bunker up. Pyrantai going to be throwing out the Booyah Bomb as well, just straight into the middle of the map, and it will be just past the halfway mark here before our blue team gets back on the tower and makes their way back to mid. Yeah, this is going to open that opportunity to try to kind of do a reflection of what... Uh, of what the tacticians just did. Kingpins are now moving forward. They are on that second checkpoint, but there is no tacticians to be seen. As you can see, Nine and Lily working together on that plat to hold them back as much as they can. But unfortunately, the tower is going to be a little stagnant here. We're, we went away from the checkpoint just for a couple seconds there, um, and got it back, but then lost it again in the firefight as two members um, of the tact or of Kenzie's Kingpins go down. Yeah, that was Barry, too, expending the Kraken Royale and looked like just could not either make it up that wall or make it on top of the tower. You know, this is that phrase, Kraken taming, as we see Dude now taking over that responsibility. He has no trouble making it up and is even going to try and chase some members there into spawn, but not necessary here, as it looks like they're going to have to double back because the tower is being ridden. Dude trying to find at least one member. The super jump coming out. They're going to have to take some time to do that one as well. It's a 1v3 now, as it's just the sloshing machine remaining nine taking firm control of mid here with this heavy edit splatling and the tactical or something else that can be used as a major buffing point here is now they are firmly in the spawn but they lose a couple of members pirate die getting the splat there with the sloshing machine and they just might be able to stop them before that third checkpoint they, but they still got make it three picks for Pyrantai as they take one more and make their way into mid. A huge bite um, out of the tacticians there as the tower makes his way back to mid. They got all almost to that last checkpoint there, Zach. Super close, but just not quite, not with Pyrantai there uh, to pick up the pieces and clean up. You can see Barry trying to come back from the Kraken Royale, probably just trying to go in for a chase, but unsuccessful in finding the pick that they're looking for. But still, the, uh, the tacticians are going to hold on to this tower once again. I mean, where? Where are Kenzie's kingpins? It seems like they are so good on the defense, able to make the stop, but they're just not quite finding where that tower is at. Yeah, it looks like the kingpins were prioritizing holding on to their specials there, but they're losing them just as quickly as they're building them. They lose one in the form of that crab. That gets taken down pretty quickly. Now the Buya bomb lands right on nine whole grains, and that's a sad grave there right in the middle of Mahi Mahi here. Pyrantai, it looks like, has been doing a great job of holding the kingpins there at bay. Now moving forward here, they've got a little bit of momentum as they try to get map control in mid. They've got it now. It looks like Pyrantai could be throwing off some of these fizzy bombs to try and maintain that control. We also see the Wavebreaker coming out and Pyrantai, it looks like, had to dodge multiple different things. The Wavebreaker ultimately going to be their downfall here as Chara gets, it looks like, maybe an assist or at least some uh, damage off onto that crab tank. And for the moment, that's going to be two down. The trade coming out. Barry trying to hold down the tower here as we have just five seconds left on the board. 
And I don't know if that's going to be enough time for the Kingpins to turn it around, unfortunately, because even if the Kingpins were able to break that other checkpoint, they would have to jump out and with overtime starting. Um, so I think that... Uh, I think that... Um, Oh, I keep getting them mixed up. I think the Tacticians had a really good hold throughout that game. And also Chara. Holy smokes. Chara kept trying to come through and breaking down splat walls left and right. Um, going in and getting a lot of picking damage, a lot of poking damage. I mean, that was just like... They gotta be watching out for Chara if you were getting close to that tower. I was a little nervous for the Kingpins there. Yeah, I think if you're uh, at all familiar with the content there of Chara, you know that blasters are in their real house, range blaster. Uh, it seems like a weapon just on its own that um, has been picking up in popularity. You know, the Wavebreaker has gone through a couple of iterations too. You know, when you throw it, it now has that uh, seeking almost point sensor like effect to it in addition to the three pulses. Uh, and a couple of Kraken Royales reminiscent of some of the earlier Splatoon's Krakens, which were so useful in holding on to the tower, trying to make sure that nobody could claim it in the final few seconds there. We even saw a couple of jumps back to spawn uh, that were not mandated in an effort to try and retain some of the progress that they had built toward those specials, like the Crab Tank. And uh, we just saw especially that special getting shredded down pretty quickly. So now you'll see on screen that two of the modes available have exclamation points associated with them. I believe that means that they are in danger as in this is one of the last times that they can be selected so we now maintain sheldon's requests and noobs but saf we add bath time to the mix as a potential counter pick i'm saying i'm saying just dig into the chaos really lean into it um so i would be open for bath time um and i know for sure the berry would be very very pleased to have <laughs> uh, bath time just because they are a blobbler extraordinaire um, so this would be a very, very fun game mode for them. I'm not sure about the folks over yonder on Takara's Tacticians. Not sure how they feel about bath time. However, I do think an ace in the hole for Kenzie's Kingpins would be buried there. Um, on Noobs, however, though, I think Lily would have a fun time with Noobs as they were using the splash matic earlier. Um, not quite the same, obviously a lot more accuracy, uh, but still like reminiscent of the fire rate. So maybe a little similar, um, but I would really like to know, just considering that these creators really do have their flavors and tastes uh, that they prefer, um, I'm wondering why Sheldon's request wasn't brought on quite, or like hasn't wasn't brought either brought on first, or like even if that one is not picked, I would be curious as to why, because I think these folks know how they could like cripple one of the other people, if that makes sense. Yeah, it seems like as the chaos levels go up, the more pigeonholed you become, either on the basis of the game itself or on the basis of what chat votes for, as far as if there is a weapon or something else associated, maybe a, a brand, for example, within the game that you have to adhere to. So in these earlier chaos levels, you have to, you know, use what limitations you can effectively. Now, you know, bath time, I think is, is rated chaos level two. So you really are getting into, okay, now you can only use these as a blob or the blob deco. Sheldon's request, you have one member of your team that's locked to whatever the pick is, but still the majority of your team gets to sort of go with what they're comfortable with, what they think is going to be a prevalent option. And of course with noobs, you know, everybody is on an even playing field. Exactly. Same gear, same weapon. They're all starting out essentially as even as they potentially could be with that noobs game mode. So it's about, do you want to start with the same weapon for everybody basically, or do you want to give the other team, but also yourself, that freedom to select the majority of your weapons with something like Sheldon's Request? And I think there it looked like there was maybe a little bit of discussion happening uh, offline here while we're trying to figure out the game, but bath time is going to be the choice. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Zach, I'm telling you right now, I think this is going to be a really fun one for the Kingpins because they have such a, a very, very talented blob player on their side. Um, curious to see which map that they want to pick, though. I mean, where are all the walls? Where are all my walls at? <laughs> Uh, well, you're probably not going to find them on something like Wahoo or potentially even Scorch. Manta has a pretty open middle arena, but also some pretty tight 
you know, corridors, hallways, etc., that you could play off of. In museum, it really depends where all the action is. If you're playing near those spinners, if you're playing sort of up on somebody's plat, I think there's more options for walls too. Maybe the most on museum, if not mantis. So those middle two maps are probably going to provide you with the most geometry, I guess is one way to put it. But you know, things like Wahoo, there's sort of those. Uh, ramps going downward that curve that could be sort of fun to use or you could take high ground in that regard so I'm really interested to see what gets picked here and I can definitely imagine that Barry did a fair bit of the lobbying to make this one the counter pick here. I would 100% agree with you there. I think Wahoo World is going to be the pick though based on what the chat is saying. There is extra votes too for Wahoo World which folks remember Ooh. if you do have channel points you can use your channel points to throw in an extra vote and so Wahoo World we're, we're going ahead grab your rubber duckies your loofahs whatever toys and fun things you like to bring and scrub up in the bath we're going ahead and taking a bath down at Wahoo World. Yeah, contrary to the picture here, we will not be making a secondary return to Mahi Ma here. That would just be too many bubbles, too many suds contaminating the resort waters of Mahi Mahi. Instead, the just about large, if not larger Wahoo World, which will be very interesting to see. It, it does paint decently well, I feel like, you know, at least in that straight line, you can do again sort of some swervature with your controller if you want to sort of paint a wider spread here. But it is going to be just that one zone map. It's going to be concentrated in that sort of large circular area. So, you know, there are walls sort of surrounding the area where the zone is. That could be interesting if somebody is trying to entry through one of those uninkable pathways. That could be a great opportunity to sort of catch them before they can get there. Or we may just see a more ranged battle here. And in looking at the kits of the two weapons, you can go with Sprinkler and Inkstorm on the Blob Blobber seems really good for Splat Zones to sort of have that double passive inking ability. And if you wanted to go with the Deco, that's going to provide uh, your team with the option to spot out some enemy players with that angle shooter. And then, you know, we saw it already with Tower Control, Kraken Royale, if they wanted to take a more offensive approach and sort of deter folks from getting close to the Splat Zone, that's one method that they could take. Okay, so I'm thinking I'm thinking for the folks that like to be up close and personal, we'll want to go Blob Deco. We want to mm. use that marker. You know, marker really re <laughs> marker really reminds me of uh, my Modern Warfare 2 days where we would do throwing knives. I don't know why I did, they just <laughs> they correlate to me and I will not explain my reasoning because I, I don't think that I can. <laughs> But looking at the screen, look at that. Okay, three Blob wow. Decos. So, okay. So, three Blob Decos for Kenzie's Kingpin. So, we're going hyper-aggressive with Barry, I bet, back acting as our backline Blob. However, on the reverse side for the Tacticians, you have three Vanilla Blob Blobbers and one Deco. So, you have a lot of Ink Storm, a lot of Sprinkler, um, and very little Kraken. So, I, it seems like defense versus offense to me, Zach. Yeah, I think the kingpins, as you mentioned, are sort of relying on the expert here and they'll saying, okay, we'll just push forward and leave you to do all of the inking as you know how to pilot this weapon effectively. I know players though, like Nine, they use other bucket type weapons. They use the sloshing machine, for example. So this is not entirely unfamiliar with them, but this is something that you would have to worry about too. You do have to clear away from the zone in case you're being chased like Nine was there by that Kraken Royale. And it seems like if they don't go down, they could just layer them back and forth, but they are already going to lose one and this zone is already halfway through yeah look at barry trying to just jump around a little bit and get away there's so many bubbles coming from the side of the tacticians it seems like the uh the kingpins are having trouble finding their footing they don't want to be caught um off guard here you can see dude popping that kraken royal finding one pick looking in for the second also just trying to contest the zone here they take it out of control but obviously with the kraken it's not quite enough ink uh, to really get it covered there, but with Barry able to get back in and follow up, finally, Kenzie's Kingpins are on the board. Yeah, it was essentially a 2v1 there for the Kingpins, was wondering if somehow the Tacticians would be able to clutch out, but they receive a hefty penalty. However, storming back now, it looks like, are the Tacticians as they quickly regain control of the zone, only giving up 20 points, and now it's a crack and be crack and battle here. You do have to be careful as you do have a bit of vulnerability just like that right when you come out of your special, and Chara's lasting just a <laughs> bit longer gives them the chance to survive and win out that Kraken duel. 
Yeah, I like I like a proper Kraken showdown of who's special is going to run out first. So that was unfortunate <laughs> for Lily there, but a huge win if you're Chara. Um, eating away at this penalty, might I add. I mean, I think the amount of ink storms that we have is so huge because the amount of poke and chip that the tacticians have to work with is so immense that I, I think the Krakens just need to act a little bit quicker to try to prevent any more special building. But it's hard to balance the objective when you really need to be taking your fights. And now with only a single digits left for the tacticians to try to get, take this win, the Kingpins need to just cover this zone as much as they can. As you can see, Pyrantai flying in with the Kraken and then Chara flying out with a Kraken of their own. The Inkstorm coming across to just get a little more paint on there. I mean, it's been neutral now for for at least 10 seconds here. And finally, the Kingpins once again are able to take it out of control and just reinitiate that penalty. I'm genuinely amazed. I cannot believe that they were able, the Kingpins were able to get that. That was that a zone. long time. All of the passive map control, I thought, okay, surely, you know, the team that has three with the Sprinklers and Ink Storms potentially are going to win this one out. And now they've gone down three as well. So not only did they not get the zone back in time to close this one out, they've now lost another team fight there. And one member, at least, it's going to be Pyrantai with that special. Now a second member has that Kraken on board and they're going to be able to try and trade them back and forth. Chara pulled it out and didn't even get to use it really. Pyrantai not even expend the Kraken Royale and now the penalty is completely gone about 20 points left for this one to be an upset oh my gosh and I love the, the triple Kraken pop there was right there for the last 15 seconds there was not one time where there wasn't a Kraken on the board the Kingpins were able to really stagger their Krakens and get them out just enough to extend themselves the lead with a 69 point penalty now finally the tacticians are going to eat at their own penalty with just a one second difference with a minute remaining. I mean, this has been a pretty intense bath time. This one may go the distance here. Basically, it looks like there will likely be one way or another a knockout here. We do see the one Inkstorm come out on the side of the Kingpins. Now it's going to be Dude trying to press forward here with that Kraken Royale. Not really finding no. anyone yet. <laughs> trying to get up top. It looked like somebody finally was able to get the splat. And now both penalties are gone. It's five against four with almost 30 seconds left. They're desperately attempting to paint the zone. The Inkstorm is out there. Who's going to be able to take it over? That's the lead. Returned back. Back. So despite some jitters after losing the zone with five points left, they roar back and are able to secure the victory with what looked like on paper for Splat Zones, the much stronger comp. However, it was much closer for the tacticians in that one that I think they really expected. And I, one thing I want to point out, so in those final seconds there, you could see Barry was on the left-hand side lobbing bubbles into the zone. His, his teammates were around the backside trying to take the fight away from what was happening in front of Barry, but two members of uh, the Kingpins went down as Barry was trying to push forward. So... Takara's tacticians had way more space and time to work with, um, and that was just unfortunate. But you could see that the flank was coming in, the fight was initiated, however, the tacticians just had the upper hand there and were able to take it down to the end. But I mean, down to the wire, Zach, I, I really appreciate that we just had, we had the duality of Blob Lubler teams that we got to witness. <laughs> and I just, I appreciate that a lot, because it's like, are they talking to each other? Does the other team know? Do they know that we're going to do the reverse, the Uno reverse of what they're doing? Yeah, if uh, that was just Chaos Level 2 for you, by the way, that one was incredibly back and forth. And I'm amazed that a team with the Triple Kraken Royale was able to hang on for so long and genuinely almost take that one over. But now those modes that were options with exclamation points next to them are gone, replaced by some new ones, mainly in that Chaos Level 2. And the one that we are going to be seeing here is 360 Splat Scope, a Chaos Level 2 game mode in which players may only choose from the following, either the Splatter Scope, Z and F Splatter Scope, E-Leader 4K Scope, or custom e-leader 4k scope so you really are limited to both charger weapons and scoped weapons within those four it looks like we are going to be seeing clam blitz for this one and y'all get to vote between these four maps what do you think for this one 
I'm I'm seeing a lot of umami ruins uh, coming up, but I'm also seeing a lot of humpback fans out there. So um, I'm I think I'm in the humpback pump track. I'm thinking I'm thinking we should go and grab our boards, uh, grab our skateboards, scooters, bicycles, whatever you like to take uh, to the <laughs> to the pump track. I think I think humpback humpback pump track is the way to go. But also I think if you just want to have a little more fun with it, I think barnacle and dime is the way. Yeah, I'm going to refer back to that Chara poll. Barnacle and Dime was one of the more popular maps to select. Umami Ruins not too far behind it, though. And with the votes coming in shortly here with the timer expiring, it looks like the one that we're going to be going to is... Oh, and it's a close yeah. vote as well. And it looks like we may have had some caster influence there, whether it mattered or not. We will indeed be grabbing our boards or skates or what have you and heading to the pump track for some 360 splat scope. It's like minds, Zach, like minds. <laughs> okay. The hive mind decided that humpback pump track was the way to go. And I'm just the saying. Hive mind. Correct. <laughs> You're all correct <laughs> for it. But um, to be honest with you, though, probably one of the not fun charger maps so i i appreciate that this group is like or that chad is like hey you know what we like a challenge we appreciate well, a challenge I, I appreciate all of you the melee buckets i like seeing that this is like a super circular map too and yet we're seeing one of the most linear weapons in the entire game there's there's not exactly. any deviation it's just painting a straight line Exactly, exactly. But also with the, with the topography being the way it is, all of the different elevations, stuff like that. I mean, we're putting the buckets, the rollers, all of you melee folks on hold. We're putting all of you down. You drop your weapons <laughs> and we're handing you something, like you said, where you just paint in a straight line and you can only look with one eye, seeing with one eye open through the scope. Um, so, and plus with with clam blitz too, I mean, you have to tactfully get around the map and pick up your clams and throw clams into the basket, but that can be hard to do, especially when a lot of the entry points are the two same points, you know, like whether it's in front of the basket with that little hump in front that you can try to, to hide behind, which does work, and it's ridiculous that it works. Um, or over on the left-hand side where that bottlenecky spot is that we all hate in Rainmaker where the first checkpoint is. Um, so, I mean, you kind of have limited options to work with here, and especially if you have a scope uh, beelining for you um, from that far away, you got to be really cautious. And however, you also have really uh, skilled Charger players in this game as well. So... Maybe that hump is why they called it Humpback Pump Track in the first place. We may never know, but it looks like uh, similar comps, actually. In fact, we are going to be seeing two ZNF splatter scopes as well as a custom E-leader coming out, I think, from both sides here. Uh, and they are going to be joined together with a splatter scope. So both teams thinking alike here. It's going to be an early pick going against the tacticians there, but that's going to be traded out. It's going to be a 3v2 in favor, I believe, of the kingpins as dude is going to be rushing forward, trying to see if they can grab enough clams. They don't really have a lot right now. And as you mentioned, I think that's going to be the juxtaposition they have to worry about is staying back to try and get these picks while also roaming around the map and finding as many clams as they can to do what dude is, which is getting a power clam and breaking that barrier. Yeah, and Dude did that so tactfully because breaking Kraken to get a, more so as a defensive tool, using it as an odd defensive tool there while getting a pick on Enki, however, the escape was definitely a defensive tool. But I, you got to appreciate Barry bringing out the right-hand side with the ink back. I mean, taking full distraction away from what is coming in front of the tower, allowing for the Kingpins to get it down to the 68 mark. But here with Chara on the a Kraken Royale of their own, they are going to be taking down Barry, looking in to take Dude in the process here but nobody that to, there to quite follow up and help out uh with some clams or even um like strikes you could see strikes were attempting to come out for the side of the tacticians but they were immediately canceled out yeah dude tearing it up there with a nice little shot as barry was bearing down upon them no pun intended there and barry or barry's gonna be actually bearing with them to try and push forward and get somebody that might have either inked this rail or is trying to snipe them from afar and it looks like that endeavor was successful as now we're going to see again, no real progress, but a lot of clams in favor 
of the tacticians they're going to be sitting on 17 they'll lose a member however enki was uh, about a couple of frames away from being a second one to go down there now the ink back is going to be really tough to get around they're just going to have to back barry into a corner and run away but that leaves plenty of time for dude and the rest of the kingpins to once again break that barricade and the tacticians are two down this one uh, although there's not a ton of clams around is going to mean that the lead grows larger here yeah, you got to appreciate the Barry and Nine fight happening over on the left hand side there because once again, Barry came in with the ink back, caused a huge distraction, took eyes away from the tower, allowing for Pyron Tai to come forth and throw that ball into the basket, getting it down to the 58. I mean, it was the exact same move, but on the other side, just mirrored. So, I mean, what will the tacticians do to try to uh, combat and fix that? They need to try to maybe use the ink that of their own that they have at their disposal. But I mean, that's gonna be hard to do when you have three folks down trying to go in for the fight. Cause look at this, Barry is just living under their basket right now, Zach, with vacuum number three. Yeah, Barry for the Kingpins, they're just missing that shot. It looks like it got caught on one of the boxes, but that leaves plenty of room for the triple ink strike to come out. Uh, they're even blocking the way of a power clam from getting through, and now they're just adding insult to injury. They have a, quite a few clams. They've gotten it down to where they just need four more. That's one, three more, as now a Lily trying to get a pick on the side there. They will Pirate fall, tie. unfortunately. It looked like that was a 2v1. Pirate Tie gets it! They had two left to get, and they had just enough closing it out for the kingpins and that is a sweet knockout on humpback pump track that's gonna put some fire back into the kingpins yeah i like that i like that we're just having an ebb and flow in this battle here uh between both sides because now we are tied once again with the 360 scope game i mean that was this game was made for barry let's be honest this game was, <laughs> ma this game was made for for this streamer the barry um if you have not checked them out you definitely should if you have any charger things that you want to um learn about um go ahead and go and hang out with barry but look at this so mini makers is the last one in the chaos level one that we can pick from and then if we go a layer further we step into chaos level three i believe um so giving it a hundred percent mini makers and p for perfect and so it's still anybody's game at this point because we are evenly tied we keep evenly tying we keep finding ourselves here um, but if we're going to move on to P for perfect, you have to try to cover exactly the right amount of turf. You don't want any more. You don't want any less. Um, so you have to have it be the exact amount. And I believe you have to use brushes for this. Or no, there is no restrictions for weapons on, on P is for perfect. So it's turf war, but you have to get the exact number of points. Um, and it's hard if you are fighting with somebody else that's painting over your points, right? Just like the, nor the game is. Um, giving it 100%, both teams take an attempt to try and cover as close to 100% of the map as they can in the three minute time limit. And I believe that means that you are not, they are not fighting each other, Zach. This is just one team gives it their all, tries to get as close to 100% as possible. So I'd imagine once you get into that spawning area, you're just hucking bombs. Um, <laughs> throwing tri, <laughs> tri strikes, just trying to get some specials up into those uninkable areas that you can't really reach. Um, and each team gives it a go for three minutes to try to get as close as they can. Um, and then finally, with Mini Makers, which I think this is the only game that I am unfamiliar with that I have not gotten to see yet, um, is a Raymaker match with only Exploshers, which I've heard from the TO side that this is a game that they really appreciate and want to see. Um, so I'm wondering if that is going to make an appearance here, uh, but for all we know, it's being decided in the secret chat. They are trying to uh, make a decision. Yeah, so first of all, it, it looks like the last two modes have been oriented toward Barry. So they were able to sort of split one and one between the tacticians and kingpins, the, the ones that Barry might have favored. And Mini Makers, the last one you mentioned here, is where we're going to be headed. So nice. this, as you can see, is Explosher only Rainmaker. So you can only choose the Explosher as a weapon type for this one. And we're going to be going to Rainmaker on one of these four maps. Now, we have already been to Mahi Mahi Resort, but we could go back there again. There's some nice standing points, some high ground that you could use to try and deter Rainmakers from getting through. Uh, Mako Mart, you know, some really tight hallways, uh, a couple of things like ink rails that you can try to 
um, use Brinewater Springs. Very straightforward map in terms of you just have like that uh, downward slope into a box, essentially, with a couple of, of alleys on the side. And then Barnacle and Dime, it kind of has a little bit of everything. You've got a little bit of verticality. You've got a little bit of openness. You've got, you know, some uh, walls and stuff on the side. So it's kind of your, like, average uh, Jack of all trades, master of none type of map in this regard. So very interested to see what they end up choosing. Brinewater, I think, may give you some of the highest high ground if you sit uh, atop your spawn and just wait for them to come through. But I really am curious to see what they pick because exposure is something where you have to sort Brinewater. of stay away. And this will be exactly it. I just, as you were, as you were talking and giving your analysis, which I really appreciate, by the way, Zach, you're so well spoken. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, I just see the Brinewater Spring Springs map just getting pinged, pinged <laughs> over and over and over again. And I'm like, I okay, I know where we're oh, going. No. And it, it makes sense to me with Explosher, especially. Uh, just uh, again, the amount of like you were saying, the amount of high ground that you have at the very top of the map with those in that ramp area. I mean, it's just a firestorm for Explosher, especially if you have eight of them. <laughs> on the map with the amount of rain, the amount of tracking, the amount of space and damage that each blast can give out. Um, I mean, just all things considered, this is going to be a really, really fun fight to watch because, again, you have somebody like Nine who's very talented with buckets. You have somebody like Barry who I believe um, has used Explosher to some degree, but obviously has a better time with Blob. Um, and I believe also Dude has some Explosher experience under their belt. So, you have some folks that have experimented with the weapon. You have some folks maybe that are less familiar, um, but understand like the mechanics and how it works. It's just something that's not really in their uh, typical wheelhouse, um, which you always got to appreciate that people are willing to try new things. And especially some of these folks who have been in this game for such a long time, uh, they're still willing to try new things and, and have fun with it and just kind of see what works. Yeah, and you mentioned something along the lines of it's essentially a firing line once you get far enough into that ramp because there's really only one way to go and you you can see them, they can see you. It's just, you know, some one team has the sort of downward angle, the pushing team has sort of that upward hill type angle. It's almost like Sisyphus trying to roll the rock mm -hmm. up the mountain. It's, it's going to exactly. be tough for both teams, which, you know, and I was thinking like, oh, I'm a little bit surprised that they didn't go for P for Perfect. A, because I love the picture that they used for where they painted a P, but B, because for audience participation, that's one where you're not just picking a map, you're picking um, as well that the that the points, the amount of points that they have to try and attain. But since this is counterpicking by the teams, you know, they really want to try and highlight their strengths. As you mentioned, multiple folks uh, with potential experience in using the slosher as we go here to Mini Maker. And yeah, we're only continuing to climb that sort of chaos meter as it were i think like you mentioned this was the only one left in level two and it's going to be ramped up exponentially from here on out so enjoy the only mild to medium amount of chaos that this mode will provide while we still have it yeah and i uh i forgot to um that there are, is multiple explosions now i forgot hmm. with the most recent update we don't we don't just have one explosion we have multiple there is two and I, I'm going to say it now, I haven't paid close enough attention to remember what the new one has at his, at, in, as its kit, but I do know that we at least have point sensor and rain um, for the other ones. Okay, so it's splash wall, and, or yeah, it's ink wall and splash down. So that's, uh, okay, that's fun. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you're going to have five chances now to I'm learn what the custom explosher <laughs> does. And we see nine is going to be the one, one of the ones piloting it. Neither team really expending a splash wall at the start of it. You can see they're really prioritizing just getting paint. The splash wall takes up a large amount of your ink consumption and the explosher is already a pretty hungry weapon as it were. So nine and the rest of the tacticians here trying to find the right angle to approach from neither team has lost anyone, but Maybe Nine looking for an opportunity to use that triple splash down, and it's going to be their team. The tacticians pushing forward. They're going to lose it just as quickly. Lily playing just behind the pedestal for that defense, but it's going to be, I think, the tacticians still being able to pop that Rainmaker shield three down, and that's going to be the first checkpoint gathered here for the tacticians. Wow, that was looking really, really dicey for the Kingpins. I appreciate Lily staying alive for so long um, and just trying to hold it down, but not quite having enough space to work with there. And look at that, Enki 
plowing through the splash wall, utilizing the amount of ink that came out of that last shot, I believe from nine, getting it down to the 30 mark. That was huge. Um, dude coming in with the triple splashdown, opening up the Rainmaker, but taking a pick at the same time. So finally, the Kingpins are back into mid, looking to make a checkpoint pot of their own and clear a little bit of space around this first checkpoint, um, which you definitely want to do, but also be cautious and wary of, especially with all of these triple splashdowns. However, if you are the Kingpins and you find yourself in a wipeout situation such as this, you got to be really careful because this is the Sisyphus situation that we were talking about, Zach. Yeah, Chara trying to play that defense there. It's been so momentum heavy in terms of just the swinging pendulum back and forth where we saw that big push by the tacticians and then the Kingpins forcing a wipeout. Chara trying to get at least one there as we saw one marked. The triple splashdown going to be more about survivability, I think, than even trying to take someone with them. Both teams losing a member as Pyrantai and Barry, who's been sort of that supporting player inking in the last game mode that we saw and now being one of the main rainmaker carriers for the kingpins in this one they're being patient until that moment where lily is able to push it almost to the point they needed to five points away from getting a lead it's now a 2v2 but the tacticians are going to be a lot closer unless the kingpins can jump in so for now this one is going to maintain the lead for the tacticians and they're going to be the ones to pop that rainmaker and try and get it away from that slope yeah, and you gotta appreciate the fight that dude was having kind of moments earlier there, just on the top ramp, taking a two versus one fight. But still, once again, I think the Kingpins have just done a wonderful job at this distractionary game with Barry with that vacuum multiple times. And now you have Dude uh, trying to be a distraction as well. Barely taking the lead down to the 21 mark. I couldn't even see what happened there. There's so much stuff flying around on the screen, but just enough ink for the Kingpins to push it forward just that little tiny bit. So about one minute and a bunch of change remaining here, just below two minutes, and you have uh, the tacticians going to have to try to make a pretty hefty follow-up here because even those nine points, that is still a mountain to climb. Yeah, time is not their enemy yet, and I love this play to sort of let the Rainmaker reset back into mid. I feel like it would be very, very difficult to get it off of this slope as soon as they see that the Rainmaker has been picked up. It's going to go this time in the way of the Kingpins in terms of them popping that Rainmaker shield, and the Tacticians go two down as a result. It's going to be Pyrantai, who's been a great player in this matchup so far. That's effectively a three down against the Tacticians. The last one going to be using the triple splashdown to try and stay alive, and with this lead, they're not even bothering to move the Rainmaker. Pyron tried trying to win the 1v1, but loses it to Chara. And now Chara's going to take that opportunity to move forward with the Rainmaker. They have the freedom. They're trying to make it all the way up to that last checkpoint. Can they at least get the lead? Yes, they do. Just barely. It won't be a knockout. But Chara, almost single-handedly after winning that 1v1, gets the lead at 19. Yep. What a play the opportunity and they took it but the call out was made Zach you can tell from the kingpins that that call out that Chara had free real estate was made because they tried to react as best as they could Lily's respond so fast probably beyond the scope of what the game would have actually allowed they respond so fast and now the kingpins are trying to make a response of their own here they're almost to uh, the, the starting point of that ramp they're looking to try to get some space Nine launching that triple splashdown, finding a pick. The ra only the Rainmaker and two Explosher's remaining. You gotta try to get some space there for Barry to push forward. But with, with the Ink Storm pigeonholing them over to this left-hand corner, they are all bunched up here. The overtime counter will start. However, Barry does not have much time to use here to push forward. Yeah, the triple splashdown, not one, but two are gonna be going out and it's not even the triple splashdown that gets them. It's an errant shot from one of those exploshers and that's where a comp with so many custom exploshers is really tough to fight you have your one regular exploshier throwing a point sensor while the ink storm is coming down the other side of that slope and then your custom exploshers throw down a literal barricade of splash walls to prevent literally any movement especially with a member disadvantage and that is an easy win at the end of things for the takara's tacticians using their kits really well and saf if you didn't know about the custom exploshier beforehand i'd well, I'll wager a guess that you know about it right now I do. I sure do. I feel a lot better about that. I mean, 
I mean, just wild, right? Because I didn't even think about it until seeing it on the screen, but the triple splashdown, it comes down, and you could see that Barry was really being good about, about their spatial awareness of trying to push forward. But then as soon as the triple splashdown came down, you like you said, you had a rogue shot from the other explosher, like get lobbed over it, and then just get that little bit more. Uh, taking Barry down ultimately at the end there. So it's funny how the triple splashdown can actually be utilized as like a space extender because I'm sure that the person, whoever was lobbing those shots at the end, probably pushed themselves a little bit more forward to just extend the amount of ink that they were taking. Yeah, maybe reminiscent of the original splashdown, which a lot of yeah. folks would try to use as a panic button. It, it did not have the most armor in the world, so sometimes you would see somebody midair getting sniped or blaster directed and taken out. But that triple splashdown, now that you have a couple of extended sort of clones or shadows that are also doing that splashdown, it creates such a larger area of effect. And man, that kit for this particular map where you can just create that line of splash walls that you have to use a lot of ink to try and break is really tough in an overtime situation. But now we go on to what looks like maybe our last opportunity to see a level three chaos game mode. We still have P for perfect. So again, that one is trying to, uh, teams taking turns, trying to paint the map 100% or, or to the mode rather, uh, or to the amount of uh, points that chat suggests for them to get. And so those are essentially each team 2v2ing themselves and trying to collaborate to paint the map to that specified level, giving it 100%, of course, trying to paint the map to 100%. And then Yeet is going to be the new one coming in. So Yeet is going to be based on, I believe, Clamplets. And that is going to mean that the one team is going to be trying to get the number of clams used down to zero as quickly as they can and the enemy team while they are not allowed to splat the team that is scoring they can impede them with the full effects of their kit so they can use things like their special if they want to they can use their sub and their main weapon but if they splat even one time a member of the team that's trying to get that score to zero they have to basically stay at spawn and not play for the rest of the game but we are going to be going to giving it 100 percent and saf some interesting maps that we've not yet seen on stream yet as our four options yeah everything everything on stream at this moment is something that we have not seen yet and you know what i like these picks for this game because there is of quite a few i feel like uninkable surfaces here that you have to think about with your choices and already I'm seeing a lot of the choices being taken to Mako Mart, which I think Mako Mart or Ship Shape is probably going to be the best option. However, mm. I think above all, Mako Mart is going to be the top because I think it has the least amount of um, uninkable surface. But could uninkable surface be used to your advantage in a way because that's less that you have to worry about and more time can be put into other places? You know what I mean? So, and, and then I'm wondering, like, composition wise, too, like, do you want to go for something that has a really high paint output or do you want to go for something maybe that has a little bit more range especially to get those further away spots so i'm wondering like what what is going to be go uh gone with here well and in a close boat, we are going to be going to bluefin depot a new returning map that now we're going to be seeing in a different context entirely. So what I like about this too is that we've played a couple modes in a row now where each team had to use the same weapon or variants of the same weapon or weapon type. Now you basically have the entire repertoire at your disposal with in the back of your mind the thought that while there technically will be an enemy team, it's your team. You do not want to be splatting them. You want to still collaborate to make sure that you're calling out, hey, we're going to be painting over here. Y'all go paint over there. Don't waste time time over here make sure that we're getting every nook and cranny and also that you're using weapons specials all of that stuff that is purely revolving around paint you don't necessarily need all the range you don't need the raw slaying power you just need to get 
as much of this map as you possibly can. You have one try at it and both teams' percentages will be totaled. Whichever team overall has the higher total percentage is going to come away with a point in this one. And again, game nine is the one that matters as far as deciding a winner ultimately. For now, each team just gathering as many points as they can so that they can hurt or help themselves and hurt the enemy team later on when they're preparing for that last and final battle. Yeah, I appreciate that the points, it seems like the points don't matter, but they do matter at the end. Mm. They matter They matter at the end because that's where you can, like you said, you can help or hinder yourself or the other team. And once, and having that, that amount of points or like the most amount of points is going to help you um, with those handicaps that you may or may not get. However, I do think that the last game, I believe is just an all out fight. So it, hmm. it'll it'll also be fun in the regard of like trying to hinder very, very good players from doing things that we don't want them to do. But it's like, can I can raw skill overcome all the handicap? Well, that's just it. You get your sort of sillies out of the way. But even in all the silliness, there is that element of we still want to win because the wins are going to translate to providing us with as good of an opportunity to be at an advantage and put the enemy team at a disadvantage when you get to that deciding game nine here. So again, this one's gonna be interesting because we'll technically see two games take place. We'll see the first team go at it and, and sort of 2v2 to build out um, their score. And it looks like the first team that we're gonna see is the Takara Tacticians here. So Chara and Nine pairing up, they're gonna be going with big, big swig rollers. And it's going to be swing. big swigs across the board. We have three of one variety and one of the other. I think it's going to be the Express that we're seeing primarily with one instance of the OG big swig roller. Yeah, and I, I, I like that this decision here because, I mean, big swig can run really fast. It covers a lot of ground. I mean, look at how Nine is doing this. Look at, they, look at these guys. They look like a printer. This is what the inside <laughs> of a printer looks like when it's calibrating. <laughs> And the page comes out and the, it, the, all the cartridges are trying to get in line. This is exactly what it looks like. Um, and I'd imagine that Alpha Team, it, which is the Kingpins, Kenzie's Kingpins, I'd imagine they're going to have a very similar tactic with this. Yeah, and, and it's so aesthetically pl uh, pleasing, right? Because the rollers, they just paint so perfectly in a straight line. You know, technically, even though they're they're working toward a goal here, they have less of a care about being splatted. So you can see just how well within the first minute they've gotten the middle portion of this map painted. And they have one member of each team starting at spawn. It looks like it's Chara here on one side. And they are just getting every little bit going. They also, you know, while they haven't used it yet, they do have the Ink Storm uh, available with the exception of one member here. I know they had three of the Express and one regular. So the Ink Vac uh, and Splashwall obviously not likely to be used here uh, by nine. But otherwise, they're doing a great job in this first, you know, minute and a half to where they can do a little bit of examining at the end. They can hit X and see the overall map and say, OK, where did we not get? They don't have to worry about, you know, even though nine's you know, cleaning things up a little bit, you don't have to worry about the enemy team's ink being in one place either. You can just look and inspect and say, I believe we gave ourselves the best chance possible as Enki nearly falls off the map there to get to 100% inked. Yeah, and I I, I, I want to go back to what you said about the ink storm. I'm wondering, like, what the ink storm is for. Because, yeah, like, look up in the corner there. Like, you, there is some orange paint over there, but then you want... Do you want like a little bit of blue paint on the other side too? Because you want it to be get to, you want both sides to get to like roughly fifty. But it seems like with how they have it, this is about roughly fifty because they take they took even halves of their own spawns and like repainted them. But like look at what Vasco's doing here. Vasco's also <laughs> painting in the corner there. So it's like I I I'm confused as to how um how the, like that what Vasco's thinking here in terms of points. Maybe boredom. It, it could just be that simple. It could be boredom. And also, you know, there are only two kits for the big swig. So if that is the best just raw weapon to play, then maybe you're just using it for that weapon and nothing else. And I, I think there's a possibility that this rule within this mode might come into play, which is if there is an exact tie down to the tenth of a percent, the team that goes first 
will win. So the tacticians have that built-in advantage where they are going first, and we'll have to see if they totaled exactly 100% or if they missed some small number. But this is going to be it. What did they total up to? 55 and 43.4. So 55 plus 43.4 is going to give us 98.4%. That is the number to beat for the Kingpins. 98.4%. So you, they have to get it pretty darn close. So I do, okay, so I do appreciate, I understand where all of those other little bits of paint come out then, because I'd imagine that that has a little bit to do with it to try to see if you can make it a little bit more even or as even as you'd want it to be. Um, I mean, you're probably right, though. It could have just been pure boredom from Vasco, just trying to do a little <laughs> silly over on the side there. But I'd like to think that there was some type of agenda uh, that they had. But OK, so that was it for the tacticians, Takara's tacticians at 98.4 percent. So to toss it back over, now we have Kenzie's kingpins that are going to be coming into the lobby here um, and playing the game and seeing how close of a percentage that they can get. And as we said, the percent to beat is 98.4%. That is, of course, hedging on my math being correct in the moment. But yes, I do believe 98.4%. Um, and, you know, I'm interested in the Kinsey's Kingpins, what their strategy is. You know, maybe they, you know, had one going forward and they saw what the tacticians did. And they say, oh, you know, maybe we should run Big Swig. Maybe they were thinking that from the beginning. Maybe they're going to go different weapons entirely. But to your point, um, A, Bluefin is not that big of a map. There's really, you know, we saw there was a ton of time relatively at the end left to kill to make sure that they got everything so much so that we saw uh, some members just painting over existing paint just to, you know, because they didn't really have anything else to do. Um, but is that going to be the same strategy or what will the Kenzie's Kingpins employ uh, as far as will they send one person to mid and leave one person in spawn like we saw with Takara's Tacticians? 98.4, that's pretty darn solid. It's going to be tough to beat that, but it's not 100%. So inherently, it can be beaten. So we'll just have to see if Kenzie's Kingpins were watching, if they learned anything, if they already had a strategy set up. Uh, and what they end up doing as far as how they split the two in, or the two sides of their teams, two and two. Yeah, and I do appreciate that they, um, I mean, as I feel most most people do, they tried to just paint as fast as they could, as much as they could sort of, sort of deal. Um, so I like that they had at least like a minute and a half left to just kind of diagnose, okay, is there somewhere that we're missing? Is there something that we can maybe fix? Can we adjust? Um, are you Vasco and you're just bored and want to throw paint on somewhere that was already painted uh, <laughs> and just have fun with it? I mean, who's to say? But I think that the um, tacticians gave us a really good show of like showing how quickly they were able to paint all of the inkable surface. And actually, um, to my surprise, there's less on inkable surface on Bluefin than I had originally thought. Um, so I actually am very pro this map choice. Yeah, I, I like that it actually gives the teams a chance to make that mythical 100% score, the, the absolute perfect score possible. And so it may come down to the tops of boxes, that little bit against the wall that you didn't get initially, you just moved on to other things and didn't really ever think to come back to it at the time. Three minutes feels like a long time in the essence of this mode, but I can also see it going by quickly because you do, you're not worrying about being splatted, but you are worrying about being as meticulous as possible. So it's using brain power to look at the map and communicate with your team and making sure that you believe in your heart of hearts that you got everything down uh, as well as you could, because 98.4, like I said, it's gonna be tough to beat uh, if you are just saying, oh, I think we got it and just are, not really paying it a second thought or not really going back and checking every little bit with whatever time you have left over. Exactly. And looks like we're still trying to get loaded into the room right now. Um, and, you know, I, I, to your point, I think you're so right. I didn't even like think about the bird's eye view of these maps because I was thinking like, oh, Makomar would be easier because there's less inkable surface. However, you're so right. Bluefin, Bluefin is split in half so well that it does make sense that that map was picked because it's it's exactly split in half each section is is about the same size 
Well, it, obviously it's the same size, but like <laughs> it, it just, it makes it more tangible. I think for given what the game is, it makes it a lot easier to get those two halves painted and to see where, where anything was missed. Because I feel like with Mako Mart, for example, there is a lot of elevation. There's a lot of different like heights and different uh, surface areas to be mindful of. And so with something like this, where you take out a lot of the negative space, there really is only two two like L-shaped pieces that you have to be like worried about. Right, and, and this is also, it kind of feels like a good break or reprieve for both teams because A, one team is going and the other team gets to not play or, or gets to sort of right. wait and watch and then you swap. But also we've gone from, even though teams have been, you know, they've had to select certain weapons or weapon types, they were doing PVP essentially. They were doing direct combat. This is more so indirect combat where you're still trying to best the enemy team, but you're not on the map at the same time. So it's a completely different type of competition. It is sort of that mid-level chaos but in a very fun, unique way. Um, and it is sort of that quintessential turf war where you are trying to get the most turf overall and you're just splitting your team in order to do so. So it's Lily and Dude who have both picked Big Swigs as well against Pyrenty and Barry, who are all four of them going the Express version. So if they wanted to use the Ink Storm, we saw last time that it was not necessary so much. And now we're seeing also a difference in strategy where Barry and Pyrenty yeah. <laughs> are staying at spawn instead of splitting one to go mid. <laughs> Sorry, I just thought that was really funny because it's so true. Like you could see right away they were like, okay, Dude was like, I'm gonna go out. I'm gonna go ahead and just get started on mid. We're just gonna get that ball rolling. And I like Pyron Team Barry being like, well, you, how about you go over there and then I'm gonna be over <laughs> here. And if you miss something, you can just tell me because you're right there. Or I'll see it. I'll just go over what you're doing. <laughs> kind of thing. They're doing a little duet or a dance up in spawn. They were just kind of like going like against each other, like back and forth, converging eventually. And it's scary, but I like what they're doing here where the wall, the little tiny bumps and walls that they have here. They want to check and make sure whether they're inkable or uninkable because maybe that's where that 1.6% came from that they weren't able to get last time is they thought, oh, you know, these tops of the walls aren't inkable. Turns out maybe they count toward your overall score. So with just under one minute gone by here, they've now made their way into mid. It looks like Dude and Lily forsook their um, top left part that they'll return back to. And actually it looks like they're leaving it to pirate type potentially. Um, but on the other side, Barry, their spawn mostly covered here. There is a little bit as well, sort of near the elevators that haven't been taken over yet. But with halfway, at reaching the halfway point here, they're doing a pretty commendable job. Again, we'll hopefully get a good picture in that last 30 seconds with that sort of overhead view of how strong they're looking and where they're focusing their attention near the end. Okay, so are you in the camp of the divide and conquer strategy that the team dude was going with? Or are you in favor of team Barry with the let's stick together and just pick eight little bits at a time? Oh, I mean, I like divide and conquer to start. I feel like you have to return to spawn at some point, whether you're in team I'm at mid or in team I'm starting at spawn, because that's where, especially if there's an area that you have to, for instance, super jump back to, to be able to see everything, that's where you might have to check that you didn't miss anything. And now, 45 seconds in, we're already pretty well set by the looks of things. They're just kind of swimming through, double checking everything. Lily looking over the top of that ramp, making sure everything looks good on that side, making sure the tops of the, the barricade or the walls in the middle are painted as well. You know, don't have to paint the sides, obviously, but the tops of those walls are going to be super important. And now, as we saw with the last one, uh, I think that's Pyrantai, who's kind of painting over what's already existing, just to triple, double, quadruple check and be sure that it's completely painted. I'm super excited to see the results because, honestly, it's been hard from an overhead view to tell a difference either way from both teams. Yeah, I know the exact same. They they approached the same strategy differently. <laughs> like the approach was different, but the strategy was the exact same. So I appreciate. I get it now too because you're so right. What if we throw ink over the other ink that's there, and there was something that that was missed? So seventy one point five plus twenty six point eight. Ninety eight point three. Yes. By point one percent. I think it's going to go to Takara's Tacticians, winning 98.4 to 98.3. Of course, the TOs will have to double check me on that math, but if I'm counting correctly, a 
one percent difference that's about what i expected and i'm just wondering where that other percent and a half is that neither team was able to seemingly find yeah like where was it and so you got to appreciate you could see that barry was running around and just flinging ink on on things and you're like why mm. are they doing that and it's probably for that reason like you said <laughs> where is that point where is that 1.6 percent that was missing we gotta find it it's here somewhere the devs have confirmed hidden a secret 1.5% turf ink room somewhere on Bluefin Depot, and it's up to you to find it. But it looks like the TOs are sort of tabulating the points for themselves, making sure that there was no mistake in my own on-stream calculations. But if that is a win for Takara's Tacticians with 0.1%, that is just astounding and a very fitting way to send us into what I believe will be minimum Chaos Level 4 game modes and likely the start of some direct combat once again. Yeah, and, and I like what is going to be coming up here for Chaos Level 4. Chaos Level 4, I think, is one of my favorite spots to be. Um, just because as you go lower and lower, you get a little bit more challenge. You, it gets more challenging, and you have to be more mindful of going against your better instinct. Um, and so there's one game in here especially that I really appreciate that I think is really challenging um, and got to see it earlier in this Creator Clash in Showdown number 1. Um, which is Leapfrog, which is where you have to use Inkbrush or Inkbrush Nouveau, and you can only jump to that Inkbrush player when you are coming into the map. Or if you want to move somewhere into the map, you can only jump to that Inkbrush player. Um, so I think it, I think that makes it really fun and interesting. Um, it very much limits your movement. You have to go against your better judgment. You have to time your jumps correctly with where your Inkbrush is trying to go. Um, so I think just that sort of level of chaos is what I'm here for, and I think it's very uh, creative. So I'm hoping that maybe we can go into Leapfrog. There it is. But there, too, we have Busted Rainmaker, and you are a kid, Zach. You <laughs> are a kid. I don't know if you were questioning it. If you were I don't confused, see my name there. They, they must have hidden I'll, it, the, the Zach I'll part of you are a you. kid. <laughs> I'll confirm it for you. They're talking to you. So, and you are a kid, you are playing Splat Zones. However, you are losing your squid form. So you are not allowed to be using your squid form. Ink Recovery Up and Ink Resistance are recommended here because you cannot use your squid form. You have to play Splat Zones without it. And so the map choices here are going to be really interesting, especially if you cannot climb on surfaces. And then finally, on Busted Rainmaker, uh, obviously you're playing Rainmaker. However, the players carrying the Rainmaker cannot fire it so mm. you are turning this into a three versus four scenario here to try and win the buko bucks so i love level four for that reason because it really makes or breaks the game i think like it's it makes it very very challenging your movement is restricted the amount of players that you have is restricted um or you're simply just taking out an entire mechanic altogether that you are not allowed to use so with Busted Rainmaker, we wouldn't see the heroics that Chara was able to pull off on uh, Brinewater. Basically, it was a one-man show, I think, with the Rainmaker to push right. it forward to get the lead. Right. We would not be able to see that because he wouldn't have the turf. There was nobody with him. So that would be really interesting. We basically would get a redo of that game, but with no ability to fire the Rainmaker. You are a kid, no cheating. Octoform counts as something that you cannot use as well, squid or octoform. So you can only be walking around as it were. Um, and spot zones would be interesting too, just to see again. And then Leapfrog is one of the most unique where you have to have an Inkbrush or Inkbrush Nouveau. And then they basically have to be a pacifist. They cannot uh, even get an assist. I believe it's a penalty if they assist as well as get a splat. And then the other three have to be jumping to that frog at all times. Cannot move using the left stick. It is completely banned against the rules. Um, and this one is going to be turf four. So we have two ranked modes available, one turf four option still available. So you could go, again, the non-aggressor route and just try and paint as much as you could, but it's going to be tough. You probably will still get into some combat, but without being able to move that left stick, you know, some range uh, to go along with that brush might be helpful just so that you have as long of reach as possible. And then with your kid, it, it's basically splat zones, but you're probably going to want to stack a lot of ink resistance just because you can't dip into that squid form unless you are getting 
um, Ink, I believe. You may not be able to even do that, but we are going to be going with Leapfrog, so we are going to be sticking Yay. with a Turf War format, and this is going to be fun. I think my eyes are going to be like uh, just traveling up and down and up and down constantly, tracking all the jumps to the frog in this one. So but the question is, which I think I, I also still need clarity on, and actually I think our creators are also seeking clarity on, is can the three players who aren't the frog attack the other team's frog? And we did get confirmation the frog can be attacked. The frog itself cannot attack, but the, the opposing six players that are not the frog can attack the other frog. Okay, so there's an element of protect the president here as far as yeah. if your frog goes down, you have to you you have to either stay in place until you're splatted or the only way you can move at that point is to jump back to where the frog is. So if with without that frog there, you're not going to be gaining a whole bunch of forward momentum quickly because you cannot move your left stick if you're not that frog. So Robo Ramen, Hagglefish Market, Inkbot Art Academy, and Wahoo World are our options for maps. The only one we've seen so far is Wahoo World, and the only one getting votes Robin. this time around is Robo Ramen. So one of the newer maps in the game, and there's going to be quite a lot of sort of, uh, I guess, levels, different topography, as you put it, as well, ramps to this map that could make for some very interesting games, depending on how the individual frogs set themselves up. Yeah, I. So the last time I watched this game, this happened on. Um, it was a map that was way more open than this. Mm. Like, way more open than this. I want to say it was actually on Ship Shape the last time uh, I saw this oh. game happen. So it was interesting because there was way more space to work with. The jumps were really well timed because you had people landing on really high points and having really good vantage points. Some people just ended up staying there, to be honest, until the enemy frog came in and allowed a jump to come in. But then it's funny because it's like, if you want to move somebody off, you can't <laughs> you can't jump next to them because they'll just take you out. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting where you have to uh, play with your range here and how you want to try to utilize different weapons. Yeah, and again, I, you, you, I guess, have more experience in seeing what they might bring, the other three would bring to protect their frog who's only going to have an ink brush with them. But uh, the jumps, you know, you want to have something that can react well to jumps, maybe something that either you bring drop roller with or something like a Dooley's class weapon where you can roll right off the drop. I don't know, I didn't see anywhere that things like rolling are prohibited. So that's maybe another way for you to gain movement and momentum and to be a little bit tougher Ooh. of a target to hit. Um, but again, didn't see that that's not using the left stick if you, if you, I don't think you're pressing the left stick if you just do like what would be your jump button to perform the dodge. So you may only get to go a certain way, but you do have at least one other mobility option if they're allowed to play with those types of weapons or with drop roller as an option. So I don't, I don't think drop roller is allowed because it is still uh -huh. a movement. Yeah, because drop roller requires the left stick. So I don't think okay. drop roller is something that we can use. That is not allowed. However, I would recommend maybe stealth jump because oh, if, yeah, yeah. If, if your frog is already gone and you utilize stealth jump, then nobody knows that your jump is coming. But I also wonder, well, because yeah, that doesn't utilize the left stick. So I believe that stealth, stealth jump is allowed. That's viable. So a couple of potential strategies here for the teams. Uh, I think the other important thing to think of is who do you designate as your frog? Is it going to be somebody that's more of an objective player? Like, I think that would be, if that's the case, an easy choice for Kenzie's Kingpins, for example, because Barry has been taking up that role pretty much every time. They picked, you know, the Blob Lobber that had Ink Storm on it that was more of the support class weapon. They were one of the ones mainly running the Rainmaker for Kenzie's Kingpins. But if you're Takara's Tacticians, who do you allocate in the role of the frog? Do you uh, maybe look to someone who's used Inkbrush as a weapon? That's not really super necessary because you're not doing any splatting. It's more about the movement and the mobility. But let's see, A, what weapons they've brought, and B, who's designated to be that frog? I'm gonna predict, yeah, okay, nine to me makes sense. And then, Py okay, Pyrantai on the Kingpins is their frog. So interesting, but look at the bow. 
Now, why are Barry and Dude using... See, again, this is one of those things where it's like, man, put me in that voice channel. What is being discussed here? <laughs> I just want to know. And so far, the only... So, Nine is the designated frog for the tacticians, and you have Pyrantai as the designated frog for the kingpins. And so, again, remember, you can only jump to one place. You can utilize your special. You can utilize your weapon. However, you cannot use the left stick. So you can see Lily and Dude here um, landed very close together. Um, and Pyrantai is actually now in the spawn, but unfortunate for oh, Dude, oh, oh, the oh. missiles, the missiles from the reflux were a very, very solid choice. That is an evil but effective strategy. You can't move only by jumping. That's your only potential way to get away from the missile. So if you can't time it well enough, you're basically a sitting duck. Now, I like the idea of the super chump. We are in turf war, so that's going to provide you with that extra turf. The original tri-stringer, though, it's got the whale. Could potentially be dodged if you're able to get that jump off in time. But... If you're stuck after a jump, maybe that's something that you worry about. Pyrantai, of course, going to have no difficulty dodging those missiles as they are the frog in this case. You have to be really careful here as Vasco's right there. They cannot get an assist or else it is a penalty. And now Pyrantai basically, I think, just trying to both paint and make as much space for the Leap Froggers as possible. Oh, that is so evil, too, because Vasco just straight up sat in squid form. <laughs> Because they knew if Pyrantai hit them, that that would be penalty. There's a lot of evil happening in this game. But I again, this is why I like how when these games get more chaotic. Because it's reasons like this. You have to think of little things like that. Like, again, Barry with the killer whale. You're a sitting duck if the killer whale's coming at you and you can't jump in time. It's the same thing as the missiles. You have to be working fast. Yeah, some call it evil, some call it strategy, just different ways to play the game. And you can see just huge swaths of ink only cut by these thin little paths that each of the brushes are making. Nine maneuvering around now, trying to make good use of spots that they can jump into. And again, this is an interesting facet of this map as well. There's a lot of different elevations where you can safely get your teammates to jump to you. Nine is basically almost on a scouting mission. He's saying, hey, this area of the map is uncontested or has the enemy ink. I'm going to let y'all jump here and take care of it. And then moves on to the next one. There's not a lot of back and forth between the leapfroggers because they know it's going to be tough to get a splat if that's what you're focusing on. I think both teams really just prioritizing turfing, especially in these last 15 seconds, those areas that need it. Yeah, and I, I want to point out too, I think... I'm not sure if that is a penalty or not, but I did see Chara attack the frog for one of the other, for the other side. I'm not sure if that was an allowed thing that they could do or not. Um, but I did see Pyrantai go down um, as the frog on Kenzie's kingpins. I'm, can, you can't attack the frog, right? The I frog thought has to, you said they you? could, but they, if you if you can't, that would more so embody the protect the president vibes that they're going for. And yes, we did get confirmation from the TOs here that frogs can be attacked. So that is a okay. win, a much needed win for Kenzie's Kingpins okay. here. It's now a score of four to three. And I think with just one game remaining before that pivotal game nine, we could see a tied amount of points to spend, quote unquote, on preparing for the final showdown. Yeah, and this is looking good here for our fi for the final game before the showdown. You have Eagle Eye, Clam Dash, and Hardcore Mode. All of these games are super fun and interesting. I believe Eagle Eye is one where you need to be... You, I believe a Squiffer comes into play for Eagle Eye. I think it, that's an important one uh, to keep in mind because every player must bring a Charger-class weapon. Teams may only bring at most one Snipe Rider and one Bamboozler. Um... And you have to be getting the perfect shots on people, uh, which I think is is a fun thing. But also, again, you have people that are very pro charger um, in this group of folks that are playing hardcore <laughs> mode. To me, is always fun because if it's splat, because you play on splat zones. But it's again, I was talking about Call of Duty, right? But this is where hard mode comes in because if, on hardcore mode, if you get splatted, you are done. You have to stay at the spawn. You do not get to play any more of the game. The game can easily become to last two people standing in playing splat zones, and you have to pick, um, obviously, the last one standing. That is the team that wins. But if you're splatted, you're done in hardcore mode. So that one, to me, is really fun, and, it, and it's very tactful watching what people try to do. 
Um, and then finally, you have Clam Dash, and it is a race to see who can get a Clam Blitz knockout faster, with only one defender holding out against three attackers, and it's only a matter of time. So, and in the photo for Clam Dash, you can see kind of on that bottom right hand corner, uh, someone is using a Hydra Splatling, which I think, in terms of defensive mode, that's probably going to be one of your best options with something that has a really long fire rate. So, I think any of these games are a really good choice. However, to me, it's very entertaining to see how differently people tend to play in hardcore mode. So what it sounds like is we are straying away from the typical 4v4 format in one way or another. And we are going to be going with hardcore mode. So True the way real. this one is that we will start out 4v4, but it's likely not going to stay that way. It's probably going to get down to 3v4, 3v3, 3v2, and all the way down potentially to a 1v1. We may even see one team get fully wiped, which would spell the end, of course, for their journey. And here are the four maps available for selection. Robo Ramen, Inkbot Art Academy, Flounder Heights, and Bluefin Depot. We have seen a couple of these before at this point, Bluefin and Robo Ramen being on stage, but it's gonna be splat zones. So you do wanna think, am I gonna prefer a two zone map like Flounder Heights potentially, or a one zone map uh, like something like Inkbot Art Academy? How is that going to change your perspective on what weapons you bring, whether you favor a more aggressive style where you go for those splats and try and get them out of the game permanently, or do you go more objective-based where you try to be evasive and pick weapons that are good at turfing, maybe have some range, but don't really provide a lot of offensive capability. Two potential strategies here for these teams to pick up, and wow. it is going to be Inkbot Art Academy, a new map going on stream here with seven votes to win it out. Yeah, and um, if you're paying attention to over to the chat too, lots of extra votes had and a lot of of power for Inkblot. <laughs> for Inkblot especially. So um, interesting pick for a Splat Zones map on hardcore mode. Got to be really mindful of that center tower area, especially when you have chargers. I'm looking at you, Barry. When you have chargers <laughs> that can get set up up there, but you also have somebody like Dude who's very good with that 96 gal, especially with having the Kraken Royale back on the deco. Very, very strong contender there. But then, so I'd imagine with something like this, you are going to be wanting to show up with your best, um, but you also need to be really mindful of who's on the other side showing up with their best. <laughs> so it's nice to see that you have a really good mix of different kind of people that like to play comp, people that have played comp but tend to play more casually now. Um, and you see that comp, there's actually a lot of representation in divisions in comp as well. I mean, you have somebody like Char who's in Division X, who's at the top of the top, but you also have people like Enki and Pyrantai who are actually teammates on Shark Bites together um, down in Division 7 and 8. So you have very, very uh, wide sleuth of uh, skill being represented here. So I think hardcore mode is going to be taken very seriously um, by everybody involved. Splitting up teammates, how cruel. But it, it's going to get a lot crueler here for hardcore mode. Again, the objective being uh, splat zones, but with uh, the added stipul uh, stipulation that if you are taken out, you are permanently out. So going to be very, very uh, fun to see what they bring. Again, another one of those modes that does not cap you know, what weapons you can potentially bring. You can stack multiple weapons. You can bring, you know, all four of the same weapon if you really want to. I don't know if I'd advise it, but you really get a chance to allocate those traditional Splatoon roles to folks. If you have somebody that wants to be that anchor, you can put them there. If you want to designate someone who's going to try and get a couple folks and be that aggressor or that slayer, you can. But let's see what weapons these teams are bringing to the table here on Inkbot Art Academy, our last mode before the showdown. And we're seeing a couple of side order weapons here. In addition to Dude bringing that custom E-Leader, gonna have some great range. That's gonna be going up against Enki's Tri-Stringer. Also, Chara and Nine going for, as well as Pyrantai, that tri to really bring that offensive edge. Yeah, a lot of range to be had. You have the splatter color screen coming out, but you also have D Dude with that charger. I mean, halfway across the map is already covered with that, so that's got to be pretty good. But again, and with the killer whale getting out some poking damage there. Uh, and I mean, this is a really good choice from everybody involved. Ooh. And Lily is the first one to go down, but Chara is immediately traded out by Dude, so no losses here. Um, it's a down to a 3v3. You are losing that... Um, 
Trizuka, but you're also losing out with the the, um, the arrow spray as well. So there you have it. You are at a 3v3. However, the Kenzie's Kingpins are going to be making the first splash here. They are having a really solid hold on mid, but it, I mean, but when you get to that point, though, you can see the tacticians are playing it really cautiously. They don't want to push forward. They don't want to overextend. They want to get some poking in there for sure. As you can see, those killer whales kind of chasing dude away from a, a high point or a vantage point there and get, getting them uncomfortable. But you don't want to overextend it because it can be really scary. <laughs> Yeah, that was 100% intentional because Dude has been that offensive presence for so long. Now they lose another member. It's a 3v2 and they're already down. It's 13 points needed left for Kenzie's Kingpins to take this one away. And they're in a team or a man advantage as well with it being 3v2. Oh. They get the third as well. It's going to be Pyrantai, I believe, getting the splat with the Trizuka. And even though there's one member left, it's Anki. They're not even going to be able to focus on the zone. They have a member and also, I think, a Kraken chasing them down. And that is an even 100 to 0 knockout. And what a strategy from Kenzie's Kingpins to put Dude on that custom E leader and just just plant him there like a sentry waiting for someone to peek out and using that maximum range to get the first pick and scare Takara's tacticians from getting anywhere close to the zone. That ties our points up at four, meaning it's an even strategy heading into our game nine showdown. Yeah, and, and so now this is interesting. So the playing field has been even the entire time. We move on to the final showdown. So this is where the handicaps come in, folks. This is where people can either um, increase their chances or decrease the viability of the other team and what they want to do. But especially with these teams having even points, it's going to be interesting to see where they want to try to cash in the resources. So looking in on the screen here, this is where you can try to spend your points. Takara's tacticians are the first to make the choice. And so this is where a lot of deliberation is going to happen. Uh, your team gets to choose the mode. Opponents must use four unique weapon classes. Like, there's a lot of different things that you get to pick here. Um, or do you want to just put all four of your points and opponent must boo you out 50 times before they win for all your points? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, how, how do you want to utilize the amount of points that you have to try to give yourselves the best advantage? And some of these look pretty drastic. Like for just one cost, both teams must rapid squid bag for the first minute of the match. That's more of a fun one. If you want to try and get more of a neutral ground, maybe you can waste a minute off the clock here. The ones that are costing two, which it looks like most of them do, you know, being able to choose the mode, that's more of a, a vanilla one or a plain one that can have a big advantage here. If your team of four creators happens to favor or have been good at one mode in particular, if you want want to spend all four points you can have the opponent buy off 50 times before they win um and if you uh have counter picking for example if the opponent gets to choose a weapon first then you can counter pick that's another option here so likely we may see both teams go two and two although we could definitely see the four cost one coming in so i'm really really interested to see how both of these teams who are even in terms of the um, amount of points that they have to spend allocate those points in terms of putting their team at as best of an advantage or the enemy team at a, a disadvantage as they can heading into game nine. Yeah, and for so for Takara's tacticians, I'm wondering, looking at this list here, what is the best thing that's going to be helpful for them? And so I already, I, honestly, for both sides, just considering um, who we have playing with us today, I really think that two points of right off the bat, opponents must use four unique weapon classes. If you can immediately inhibit some of these specialists at the knees <laughs> before they can even like get started or really like choose something that th would want they would want to use in this in this final fight, I think that's going to be really important because you have a lot of specialists in this showdown here. Um, choosing or. To counter that, choosing a weapon including variants that neither team may use for half of the points. Again, you have a lot of specialists here, so you want to try to take the ability to use their specialization away from them. So it gives you a lot of resources for how to do that. But honestly, I'm not really sure in comparison to both of those options. If Because to me, they both in a way kind of mean the same thing. Either way, you're just trying to get somebody to not use something that they're good with. Um, but I can't decide, like ideally which one you would want to do 
Yeah, it's tougher, right? Because the, the wording on it is choose a weapon, including variants that neither team may use. It's not a weapon class, if I'm reading it correctly. So you're not able to block out all blasters, all chargers, all splatlings, all shooters. It's a specific weapon and its variants. So like if we take that last map, for example, you can block dude from running any variant of the E-leader, but other chargers would still be on the table. So it's limiting them, but it does cost for both teams if they wanted to pick it half of their points. So it really is a gamble just to shut one person down. So that's gonna be super, super tough to finish off here. Um, I think two uh, opponents must use four unique weapon classes. That one, it's worth a lot. I mean, there are a lot of compositions that are worth running that have four different weapon types that would be difficult to take on. So really interested to see what we're gonna end up finding here. Um, and I wanna run down the list again while we're still waiting to see what these teams pick just to see what the best options might be. I think the funniest one on the board, obviously, is buy a shout out, promote your stuff. Uh, I'll, you know, put my own stakes into that as far as if you have not checked out any of these creators, be sure you are doing so. You can also use something like Cadgar or Multi-Twitch to make sure that you're seeing both our perspective and multiple perspectives. Um, all of these creators are great. They put in amazing work in their respective platforms and uh, some focus like Saf was talking about earlier on ranks or competitive. Some focus on more casual play or meme content. Some focus on Salmon Run, for example. So, or, or even art. So there's artists in here as well, I believe. So there's a ton of differentiation in the content that these creators are putting out. And I would say they're all worth a follow, a subscription, whatever their platform uses, it is worth checking them out for that. Uh, some of the ones that we haven't talked about as much are opponent team must jump to their spawn when they are halfway to victory. You know, that is for the ranked modes. It, it goes against or, or it goes with different things. You know, if you have uh, splat zones as the mode, then at 50 points, you have to jump back if you're in the lead. And that gives the enemy team basically a free cap of the zone. It may be a little bit tougher if you are on a two zone map, but for splat zones, that's how it would work. Rainmaker, they would have to stop what they're doing, somehow lose the Rainmaker at 50%, because I guarantee it's not gonna be just the checkpoint is at a perfect 50. They're gonna have to figure out a way to go back to spawn with that Rainmaker or Ink Explode in order to reset that. So that may be a valuable one to go for. Same with Tower Control, although that one, you know, it's, it's kind of a get off it, go back to spawn and then rush back to try and get back on. It's not as costly. And then for Clam Blitz, uh, again, because it goes in threes, typically it'll be a little bit tougher to differentiate, but um, I think that one could be good value for their funds. I'm also hearing from production that they may um, have chosen Splatted. So we're going to look at what they ended up picking for their totals. Of course, you see the only one there at the bottom that's grayed out. That one would have cost seven points. So you would have had to have won seven out of the eight potential modes in order for that one to be available. Saf, really interested to see while we wait uh, for the selections, what you think would be good bang for their metaphorical buck. Um, okay, so in the past I have seen, the, I can tell you what I have seen get picked and what seems to not be as useful as much as you think it would. And th honestly, it's both teams must rapid squid bag for the first minute of the match. Um, that one, that one actually, I don't think is as helpful as people think that it is. Um, especially, uh, just because, like, it, it's everybody is still on an even playing field because both teams have to do it. Um, so I feel like that one is pretty neutral. However. I, well, okay, look it. What I what did I say earlier? Takara's tacticians are gonna pick. A, oh wait, no, that's not the one I was talking about. Man, I got so excited, <laughs> Zach. Okay, well, opponent it team still was jump to happen. spawn. I know there's still time. There's still time. There's still points to be used. Opponent team must jump to their spawn when they are halfway to victory, um, only for the losing team. So this is one where it like kind of worked last time. However, it didn't really seem like the jump back, like gave the other team the advantage. It actually gave the team jumping back the advantage because they were able to re-enter as a group. Hmm. 
So it like I don't, and I don't know if it was like the dynamic or it was weapon being you know like there's a lot of different variables that could have impacted that. But from what I noticed last time this was played and that was picked, it actually was very very good um for the team that was re-entering. It actually helped out quite a bit. So um I can see the advantages of that, but I can also see where it could get a little dicey, especially if you have people that can really come back in well on the respawn and like recalibrate their brains. I think that can be really, really tricky. But so I didn't, okay, so it's a back and forth pick. So now the Takara's tacticians have made their choice. We're passing the baton over to Kenzie's, uh, Kenzie's King, King's, King, those ones. That one. <laughs> that one and we're passing <laughs> we're passing the baton over to them and they're taking a look at this list and also deliberating um and i'm wondering do, what they are gonna go with their pick and because the other thing too is you have to you have to remember their pick is going to be impacted by what takar's tacticians picked as well so that also has to be brought into the conversation so there's a lot of things to consider yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, the one that's been selected, the one that we know is going to come into effect is likely mode dependent. I think for some modes, it's going to be better than others. Um, and that is where your team choosing the mode, maybe that's a counter pick there. Maybe now you get to select a mode where that choosing uh, to super jump at halfway to victory, that doesn't come into play as much. It, it can sort of eliminate that. But we are seeing that what's selected here at the bottom is opponent chooses weapons first and you counterpick. So you get sort of that eyeglass, that magnifying glass, those sort of infrared vision to see what the enemy team is going to be running. I feel like that could provide a huge advantage in terms of knowing what weapons do not work well and what do work well against a composition of that style and get to play off of that. So that is a valuable one to see just so that whatever the mode or map is that you go into, you can pick things that either can overwhelm your opponent, can be hyper aggressive, or can maybe just outrange them, can just be uh, death by way of a thousand cuts, for example. Um, so really interesting to see that one get picked. I think that one is pretty good value at two cost, um, which makes me think that the other ones selected are probably also gonna be two cost. Like you said, rapid squid bag with that one cost could come into play, and that could leave them maybe with the other one cost other than buy a shout out, which is choose a weapon that neither team may use for half your points. Um, that comes down to one as you know, we're down from four to two for each team. So that one becomes a little bit cheaper. So you could go the one in one style or if you think the two cost one is a little bit more effective, maybe you really want to pick the mode now um, or you really want to be able to uh, buy off, make them buy off 50 times and they're going to go for the mode. So I think that's a really smart decision. I think being able to pick the mode now that they know uh, their weapons are going to be inspected, essentially, they're going to put themselves from a mode perspective into the best chances possible to make it away. That's going to be all their points. And now we just have maybe one or two selections left. Yeah, I've been I've been subtly nodding my head to everything that you're saying because again it's like because no it's true though right because the fact that the the each side can only pick one only pick one cost once and each side gets to choose based off of the decision of the other so it, I mean you guys can't see it but from our side in the private discord channel where the teams are kind of deliberating what they want to pick um they are discussing with tos just to like clarify the rules on these things so the reason why that we're like there's a lot of conversation going into this is because these teams really truly are deliberating what is going to give us the best bang for our buck here with the points that we're using and um that's a good thing to know too when you're playing in these tournaments you guys i mean ask for clarification from your tos that is why there is a help desk it is there for a reason. It is there for you to use <laughs> if there is something that you're confused on. And if you want your experience to be the best, that is why it's there and the TOs want to be able to help you with that. So both teams are, again, deliberating. Kenzie's are trying to figure out what they want to do with the last of their points here. Um, and it looks like we are about to reach a decision for them. They do want to be the ones that pick the map. Um, so again, think about that. Takara's Tacticians, they are picking the mode, but but the, mo the mode that they are picking, which I believe is tower control, they want to pick the map. Kenzie's, Kenzie's want to be the ones to pick the map. So um, that's interesting. 
uh, for a way for them to split the responsibilities. They do have one more point that they get to spend. Um, and the only things that they can pick is those bottom three white ones right there. So choose a weapon, including variants that neither team may use for half of your points. Um, opponent must booyah 50 times before they win for all points. Uh, both teams must wrap its squid bag for the first minute of the match. So um, from my perspective, Zach, I think choosing a weapon, including variants, would be the, the next plausible thing uh, to, to choose from here. Just because in my experience, the last two available options I don't think really affect the game all that much. Yeah, in, in my mind, I think the weakest of those three would be the middle one. I, I feel like you can fire off some booyahs pretty effectively or even tailor your comp around it. You could run two, three, four weapons that have booyah bomb as the special and just build it up that way. So I think one or three is going to be probably the more favorable option. Uh, that could be Caster's Cursed um, now that I've said it, but I really do think there's been a lot of sort of weapon uh, dependent selections here. So maybe that top one of choosing a weapon that neither team can use is the play here and, and saying, okay, we want to sort of take away that option. So here is what we have at the end of things. Kenzie's Kingpins must jump to spawn at 50 points remaining for ranked or a minute 30 for turf war. Takara's Tacticians must choose their weapons first and Kenzie's Kingpins gets to counter pick based on that. Takara's Tacticians also are choosing the mode with Kenzie's Kingpins choosing the map. Uh, I think Saf said earlier the, they were hearing some murmurings of tower control. We'll see if that comes to fruition. And finally, both teams must spam ZL. So squid bagging for the first minute of the match is the final selection here that, of course, as mentioned, is going to affect both teams. So we will see some intense ZL spamming action to start. And then it will be all seriousness from here. Saf, you said you were looking at the channel where that discussion was being had. The first eight or so modes, sort of all fun and games, only a few times were those questions being asked. Now, both teams want to make sure they have as clear a picture of what they need to do to visualize victory as they possibly can in this serious Game 9 showdown. Yeah, and, and we're finally getting down to what the map pick is going to be. So I believe the mode pick coming out from uh, Takara's Tacticians, they are going to be picking Tower Control. And now Kenzie's Kingpins are just in discussion of what map that they want to pick. Um, and so that, I, I really like the, the division of labor with making these decisions of where they want to play <laughs> with the showdown. Um, I really appreciate that. But also you have to think of like in the, in the first ZL chaos that's going to be happening within that first minute, a lot of discussion in the voice chat is also probably going to be happening at the same time, I'd imagine. They're probably going to try to deliberate right off the bat what they want to try to do. And especially when one team has the upper hand of knowing the composition of the other. Um, that's going to be pretty huge to get to p make counter picks based on that. But, you know, sometimes I wonder about that, Zach, because when you have so much raw skill, sometimes I don't even think making weapon counters even matters. Sometimes uh, when you have people that just know what they wh know what they know and have been playing this game for as long as some of these folks have, they kind of just get it. And if you know, you know, if you're if you're in, you know, sort of thing. So I'm wondering um, if knowing the having the opportunity for Kenzie's Kingpins to counter pick, um, I'm wondering how that is going to really come to fruition for them. But I do think that maybe it could be helpful, especially because you have um, a really mixed skill cap on either team. That so I feel like maybe having the counter pick for Kenzie's Kingpins can maybe help with some of that skill gap that they're that they could be experiencing, or um, you know what have you. And yeah, some other good questions alongside that being brought up. So despite the fact that they have to be spamming ZL, they can move. So we could see a world in which they go to the middle of the map by that, you know, minute gone by mark and then just all heck, all chaos can break loose. So that would be really interesting. It doesn't seem like they have to be in spawn. And for the map, it seems like it's going to be Mince Meat Metal Works that they will be going to. We also have the determined comp for the first team here for Takara's Tacticians. They said they're going to be going with Range Blaster. I believe they're going to be going with Heavy Edit, Clash Blaster Neo, and Splattershot. 
So that is what I'm seeing as the first composition. That will be what Takara's Tacticians allegedly will be running. And Mincemeat, if I'm being honest, Saf, that's not a map that I saw coming as far as being picked. Yeah, I I enjoy that that was the decision that we, they went with. But I it, it it looks funny from our perspective looking in the Discord channel because it looks like Barry just said Mincemeat. <laughs> like there was no discussion had they just said it and then it was like okay you're right that's <laughs> that's agreed upon but of course it was probably discussed and they were like no that's actually uh that's actually what we're gonna do so um <laughs> tower control mince meat um and everybody has to smash the squid the squid button for at least the first minute before they can jump into the action um and again, we're still deliberating and getting some clarity is as if, um, do Kenzie's Kingpins need to jump out at the 50 or do they jump out at the uh, the two minutes and 30 seconds remaining? Um, so does it go by the actual scoreboard or is it going by the actual amount of time in the game? Um, and it sounds like it's, it's going to be chalked up to 50 points. So when Kenzie's Kingpins reach the 50 point mark on the tower control game, they all must jump back into spawn and re-enter the map together. And again, that's if they make it to 50. We're going to yeah. have a minute gone by where nothing really, uh, no progress is being made on the objective unless they're somehow able to get enough height to jump perfectly on the tower. I don't think any progress toward the objective is going to be made in the first minute. So you're going from five minutes to four minutes now. Uh, for an amount of time in which you can get a knockout, or in this case, get to 50 points and then have to jump back if you're Kenzie's Kingpin. So uh, most of the rules will be having, will already have taken place or will be in effect in the first minute. The only other one that really will matter for the rest of the game is what we've been describing, where Kenzie's Kingpins has to jump out at the 50 point mark. So this is it. As you can see on screen there, winner takes all game nine, the actual showdown between Kenzie's Kingpins and Takara's Tacticians. And there's the composition that we alluded to earlier. Here are the counter picks on the side of Kenzie's Kingpins. It's gonna be a Snipe Rider, a Sloshing Machine Neo, a 96 Deco, and just a vanilla splash omatic reminiscent of a meta gone by to round out their composition with a little firepower. Yeah, and you know, this is about what I expected, to be honest with you, because again, you have Dude on the 96 Deco, uh, which I was already anticipating. You have Lily pulling out that splash again, which they pulled out in game number one. Barry, of course, being on a charging weapon. I like that they picked the pencil for this. They want to have as much ink as they possibly can down on the map. And remember, folks, in this minute of squid bagging, you can move across the map. So there is some tactability with this here because because people are moving into position of where they want to be. Look at this. Will Char be in a two versus one situation Whoa. when that minute chimes down? Is that what will happen? I mean, it could happen. Is Vasco gonna get enough distance away from Lily to find safety? Enki is in a really good place to technically shark, um, <laughs> even though there's no ink on the ground. But Nick, this is where the real battle is coming into play. They did want to pincer off Chara as quick as they, they could. Chara did go down in the trade, though, so I think at, overall, at the bare minimum, you at least want to go down in a trade in a two versus one. Um, but the first checkpoint is going to be taken by Kenzie's Kingpins. Yeah, I liked the positioning of Kenzie's Kingpins just a lot better. They had Lily sort of right in front of that uninkable grating there, positioned to get on the tower. Like you said, they sort of cornered off Chara for a 2v1 in which they were actually able to trade, but still, you're going to win the 2v1 the majority of the time, but it's actually going to be a lead here. Now going in favor of Takara's Tacticians here, the tower going to continue to move as Lily tries to play some defense with that crab, but it's not going to be enough, and Chara getting the splat while also putting the rain her down just in time before being splatted and now without the restriction of having to go back to spawn at 50 points it's gonna be so far all Takara's tacticians here as they make it to the 40 point range yeah and immediately the follow-up is going to be coming out from Kenzie's kingpins here they are on the tower pyron is in a good position with special online just waiting to find the right opportunity to use that trizuka and I mean 
they're going to be waiting for a little bit here, Zach, because this map is very true blue as finally the Trizuka comes out and they go and off for the left-hand side. Finally, one member get, I believe that's Chara, gets taken down. Enki getting cornered here by the crack on Royale from Dude and opting to jump out, which, I mean, very, very successful jump out on their behalf because they needed to get out of danger as quickly as possible. However, they are jumping back down into the fray. You can see Lily was trying to help out Dude in the fight there, but Dude is able to be successful even with losing Lily in the process. Um, Kenzie's Kingpins, though, still struggling to find some time to get onto that tower. A really nice pick from Dude, though, with that type of range. Um, unfortunately, though, with that another uh, Vasco being in the corner there and trying to come out and prevent them from getting any forward momentum. Not going to happen, though, when you're Dude on the Kraken Rail and just taking Vasco away from that corner and preventing uh, any more momentum or movement. Um, from taking into that point of position. But now, finally, Kenzie's Kingpins are on this tower. We're getting moving down to that first checkpoint. They want to get this first checkpoint break because as soon as they can do that, so much more space to be had until checkpoint two. Yeah, dude just playing with his food at that point, and they've done great. It's a three-down situation here. They're looking for the last pick, which would be on nine, and they get it. That's against the heavy edit splatling, and it's with the Trizuka of Pyrantai. Now, again, at 50 points, they are going to have to jump out, but they make sure to grab the tactical rebuff before that, but they're not going to make it there quite yet. It's a 2v2. They've made it to 57 points. They lose a third. It's just the vanilla left, and the vanilla splash is down, so we're not even going to see that jump out yet. What if it gets to an overtime situation, and they get to 50 and have to leave the tower that's basically game over so now they have to get a mad dash get some picks going but chara gonna leverage getting one spot another one goes down as both the snipe rider and neo sloshing machine fall and this might be a tall order here to make sure that for kenzie's kingpins they have enough time to move forward get to 50 jump out and still have time to take the lead yeah, and the movement from Chara here is absolutely insane to watch. These these squid rolls and the jumping and the amount of movement that they have with the blaster here. I mean, the amount of mobility that they have is just insane, uh, resulting in the wipeout. A huge assist in the wipeout there as as Takara's tacticians finally move their way onto checkpoint three with the checkpoint falling. Single digits here as two members go down. However, the firefight is still in favor of... Kenzie's Kingpins in the spawning area there is now all four members of the tacticians have been removed from the tower at the two point mark with eight seconds left remaining. This is the momentous mountain that that needs to be climbed by the tact or by the Kingpins if they want to try to reverse this in overtime. However, I mean, Takara's tacticians have had the tower this entire time. They've had a really good foothold, but they don't want to be losing anybody here. This is crucial where the trades don't want to be taken because, I mean, this is where it can snowball. I don't know if they can win. I mean, they, they've cleared three, but they have to jump out at the 50-point mark, so it really is going to come down. Lily's able to get back on the tower before... Uh or anyone else gets on it they're able to make sure that that tower still moves dude expending the kraken royale as well it gets to 50 they're still maneuvering with it they have the crab on there as well they've gotten two so they might be able to take this it's a 2v2 situation here anki with the trizuka trying to catch barry but it's not quite able to the momentum's still going they lose all but one are they able to jump back in in time no down almost to a knockout it's gonna be a master class performed there an amazing job to finish out this game nine showdown here and the winners are going to be takara's tacticians taking a very close game yeah and remember folks the folks over on takara's tacticians you have pro chara you have vasco games you have enki pnw and the nine hole grains congratulations to takara's tacticians for this showdown number three on creator clash i mean had down to the wire quite honestly down to the wire i mean technically a five versus a five to four set uh which is a, which is just exactly what you would want i mean it doesn't get any better than that yeah, it's as close as you would want it. And I've loved seeing each of these creators sort of display and exhibit their uh, proficiency on different weapons, whether you're mandated to one or one type or whether you have the freedom to choose. We got to see things like Turf War, which we don't get to see in major tournaments often. Um, and of course, mixing in some rank modes there as well. Got to see a couple of clutches. Chara had a great one in Rainmaker. We saw uh, a Clam Blitz mode that ended a lot quicker maybe than it should have. I think Pyron 
Tai was the one that secured that yeah. one with the last couple of clams. They were the last one remaining there. So really, like you said, close back and forth. We talked about that pendulum effect swinging back and forth and some audience interaction as well, mostly picking some maps and providing some great input. Yeah, I agree with you there. This has been a really fun time. It's it's really, uh, as I said, it's fun to watch people that not only create, because remember, all of these folks on here are either are streamers, I believe, but it's also just fun to watch people that are at different levels in comp. I mean, you have folks that have played comp for a long time. You have some that are coaching. You have some that are in uh, that play in a lot of lower level tournaments. It's just nice to see that all pieces of the spectrum are represented in this creator clash um so it's just fun to, it's fun to get to celebrate that but also get to celebrate the creators as well and celebrate that these people get to do some really awesome work um and it's nice to see that hey you know what it's not it's it's all fun and games sometimes it's not all seriousness sometimes it can just be silly uh fun and games and you get to hang out with your fellow creators and do some fun stuff with them so it's much appreciated it's fun it's it was a blast getting to be here again on off the off the dial and especially with you zach um this has been a really fun way to spend an afternoon so i would really like to know if i'm gonna open my web browser and i'm gonna look you up and i'm gonna say hey you know what where's my pal zach at where can i find you Likewise, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, too heavy on the socials these days. I do have a Twitter. It's at Shiny Hunter Zach. I'm also on Blue Sky, if any of y'all use that. I'm basically Shiny Hunter Zach just about everywhere. Um, the creators and yourself, I think, are the ones that really uh, deserve and demand support here for, you know, the content that you create, the commentary that you do as well. And, you know, just the fact that this is not the only one of these that has been done either. You know, we've had at least two other ones that have taken place with a ton of different great Splatoon creators that, as we've mentioned, have sort of cross the spectrum of, of ranked and competitive versus casual versus salmon run versus just memes or art there's a lot of different types of splatoon content out there for people to enjoy and really this is a great way for folks to find out where those creators are so saf i'd love for you to get the opportunity to share your socials and everything as well and if you're working on anything super cool you'd like to share Absolutely. If you want to find me, you can find me at Twitter at Safireo. That's two P's, two A's. Uh, Twitter um, or on Blue Sky, I guess. I don't really use Blue Sky, but if you want that, that's totally fine. That's up to you. Um, you pretty soon, you can find me running the streets of Austin, Texas at LTC coming up in May, which is very exciting. Um, potentially in uh, going to be seeing folks at Riptide in September. Only time will tell with that one. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing so many folks in person again and just hanging out at the fire pit at LTC. So that's going to be a really fun time. But also, you can find me over at IPL tomorrow for HP for Heroes, uh, closing down the big charity event between IPL and Dapples, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. So... Um, yeah, just a lot of a lot of mic time, really. A lot of mic time and a lot of travel experiences coming down the pipeline. Yeah, tons of great activities and events and tournaments still taking place here in Splatoon 3. Again, if you are attending LTC, enjoy. Round Rock is and the Kalahari are great environments, and there's always something to do there and some great high-level Splatoon to watch in person, which is always great. There's nothing like that crowd atmosphere. Saf, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure. I'd love to also thank you know DJM and the TOs and everything and our fantastic creators today for running things. Um, but that's it for myself. Anything else you want to sign off with? Uh, no, I mean, wear a mask, drink water, uh, make sure that you're taking care of yourselves and taking care of each other and, um, you know, spread love in every possible way that you can. Well, thanks everybody so much for watching for Saf uh, and myself, Shiny Hunter Zach. This has been the Creator Clash Showdown number three presented here on Off the Dial. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.